Um, so welcome everybody to this um, lecture, special lecture. Uh, I'm Angela Leung. I'm the uh, director of the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm also the uh, principal coordinator of a collaborative research project called um, Making Modernity in East Asia, uh, which, um, which hosts this uh, lecture. Um, you know, our, our project has been disrupted, of course, by the COVID since January this year. I, you know, we have canceled a lot of lectures and we are very happy that we can kind of uh, start doing things, um, uh, organizing lectures and workshops. And many of those will be online, however. And, and we are particularly happy and grateful to uh, Jenny Smith, uh, who is uh, um, teaching at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, she is a um, STS scholar trained in MIT, and, um, and, and she has been teaching at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for a few years. And, and since then, she has been a very um, close collaborator of our collaborative project. And we are very happy to, to, with, to, to have her with us in many of our meetings. Um, but Jenny is a, um, a specialist um, on uh, food, I would say, uh, food technology or famine technology. Uh, she specializes um, on Soviet history, Soviet famines, and how, how the Soviet Union dealt with famines, which has published a lot uh, on this topic. But today she's going to talk about a more on a more cheerful topic, I would say, <laughs> on beer, on beer and game, I would say. And, and I, I think she will explain it um, uh, clearly to us uh, in her talk. It's called um, a Lega or the Doublet of History, 10 Centuries of Asian Influence in Europe. It's a mo most intriguing title. And I think uh, like all of you, um, I really look forward to um, uh, to learn from uh, Jenny, um, so uh, so I I won't uh, I will stop here. And um, after my introduction, uh, uh, Professor Jenny Smith will talk, and then um, my colleague Kasan Mozin will moderate the discussion at the end of the um, of the lecture. So please welcome uh, Professor Jen Jenny Smith. Okay. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, Angela. I appreciate that. Um, and I really love the work that IHSS does um, over at HKU. Uh, you're nice people to, uh, to have in the community here in Hong Kong. Um, so here's, uh, let me just share my screen so you can see the slideshow associated with this. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, one more second. Okay, um, so if there's a problem with sharing, uh, somebody should let me know because I now can't see any faces or the chat box. So um, just let me know if, if something's wrong, please speak up. Um, so the inf inspiration for this talk is not uh, my abiding love of lager beer. Uh, I don't drink a lot of beer. And when I do, I tend to choose one of those overhopped American ales uh, that nobody who actually likes beer has any respect at all for. Uh, so instead, the inspiration uh, for this talk stems from my continued uh, weak grasp of the Russian language. I am, as Angela mentioned, um, a Soviet historian, uh, or at one time I called myself a Russianist, but that title only applies if you apply extremely low standards. Um, I learned Russian in graduate school and I'm just not that fluent. Um, in any case, in Russian, there are two quite similar words, uh, lager, the beer, um, and lager, uh, which is a word that can mean camp, but is also commonly used in Russian to refer to prison camps. In the word gulag, for example, that lag comes from lager. Um, and, and honestly, until I sat down to write the description of this talk, uh, hand on heart, I thought they were the same word. Uh, so uh, this odd synonymy or perceived synonymy between these two words um, is one of those 
uh, little oddities I have thought about sort of passively from time to time without really stopping to think why these two words might be so similar. Um, at least not until I started thinking about uh, refugee camps as a historian, which is uh, part of my new research project. Um, so let's just get this out of the way at, and these are uh, refugees here in Hong Kong from, I believe, 1979. Um, so let's just get this out of the way at the beginning. Both words are related to the idea of storage and laying something down. So lager, the beer, was a beer that fermented at a cooler temperature and tasted best if it was allowed to age slowly in a warehouse setting. Uh, lager, the facility, uh, was originally used to describe many different kinds of camps and encampments, uh, anywhere that provided sleeping accommodations, basically. Uh, this is not a major insight. This is how a lot of English and German root words work with close similarities between two fairly different words. Um, but in this troubled year, uh, one of my major frustrations has been that some of my uh, research into refugee camps uh, has been stalled because obviously nobody is traveling anywhere. Um, and so while that's an important part of my job, that archival research and interpreting those documents for a new audience to show their meaning, um, another important part of my job is telling stories. So telling stories well is, is hard. And eventually this story that I am about to tell you will circle back to two uh, scholarly topics that I work on, the history of uh, refugee camps, and as the title of this talk implies, the interconnectedness between Europe and Asia uh, over a very long period of time. Um, so hopefully you'll learn something uh, from this talk and you will not be completely bored. Um, the structure of this talk is a little unusual. Um, I... I based it on sort of a historian's version of a game that Lewis Carroll invented in 1877, uh, which he initially named doublets. Uh, he later preferred the name word ladder, uh, which is, this is the cover of a, of a book for it. Um, and this game was a runaway hit in Victorian England. Um, uh, the premise of the game will be familiar to most of you. Uh, the idea is to sort of evolve one word into another word by changing just a single letter, as you can see on the, the word ladder uh, going up from the three-letter word ape to the three-letter word man by changing a single letter. Um, each one must be a, a real word. Uh, so my idea on how to tell a meaningful story about this similarity, about refugee camps, um, was by starting with beer. And it's inspired by this game because they're two very dissimilar topics. Um, and it occurred to me about halfway through writing this talk that I could have been really clever with the execution of this game. And I could have actually created words that were the subjects that I talked about. And then each word would have changed one letter, et cetera, uh, much closer to what an actual doublet would have been. Um, but I'm not that clever. So uh, that's, that's, this is really sort of more of a topical uh, exploration where I sort of jump from one odd topic to another odd topic. So that's, that's what you should be getting ready for here. Um, and so let's start with the first topic, uh, which is beer. Uh, this is an interwar picture of a Munich beer garden. I like to think that's Walter Benjamin there sitting facing us um, in 1931 or 1932 before he left Germany, but I, he really was not in Munich much, so it's not very likely. Um, but in any case, uh, let's start with beer. Broadly speaking, beer has been around since the invention of agriculture. Uh, in fact, it's entirely plausible that the main reason uh, for agriculture initially uh, was because surplus grain production enabled and maximized the production of alcoholic ferments, which were pleasurable to drink and also created a more valuable product. Um, so in most ancient societies, uh, the brewing of beer was uh, originally women's work. Um, and the first case study here we're taking is German beer. And this was taken over by men in Germany. It became men's work uh, about a thousand years ago, around the turn of the first millennium. Um, and this was because beer became more of a commodity and less of a home produced, uh, home -produced item. Uh, so, uh, and the production also scaled up. So churches and monasteries took over brewing often and used it as a way to create a stream of revenue for their organizations. Um, 
And for the first time, you could also pay taxes uh, in beer uh, throughout the different um, throughout different parts of Western Western Europe. So there's a lot of beer history. Um, I recommend a beer brewery tour for a lot of this. Uh, there are a lot of beer historians out there. Within food studies, it's one of the few topics that uh, uh, guys kind of care about. And so as a result, there's a lot written and a lot published and um, it's, it's just a, a pretty thriving topic. So I won't pause for too long on this initial sweep of beer. Um, just to point out, the magic of beer is not in the grain or the water, but in the fermentation process, which uh, is controlled by yeasts. And this is a process over which humans have slowly gained more control over, um, in a, sorry, they've slowly gained more control in the process of domestication. And like most processes of domestication, the domestication of uh, the organisms that ferment uh, that ferment beer has speeded up, it's been refined, and it's created new categories of wealth and value. Uh, beer has become an industry, a very profitable industry. And some of the impulses that created and refined this industry are some of the same impulses that created and refined various other institutions of modernity, including the incarceration facilities, the, uh, the uh, prison camps uh, that I'll be talking about in a little while. Um, so wild beers do exist, totally undomesticated beers, lambics, for example, are an example of that. Uh, but for the past thousand years or so, most beers brewed in Europe have used uh, a strain of sugar loving yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and you can actually see a wild version of Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, here on these plums as that uh, soft white powder on them. That's actually uh, a large yeast colony. Um, these are warmth loving yeasts. Uh, they're happiest at about 60 to 70. Oh, uh, they're happiest at about uh, 20, one to 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, they are typically brewed in the late spring and as uh, summer ales. Um, the yeast that, and here's another picture of, uh, of Cerevisiae. This is a, a microscopic image of these single celled organisms. Um, the yeast that makes lager, specifically lager, is different from the yeast that makes ale, or it has an extra ad additional uh, um, uh, organism at work. And this is Saccharomyces pastorianus. Um, and you can see a picture of this here. Um, and there are several things that make this yeast special. Um, and this is the end. Sorry. There are several things that make this yeast special. Uh, first of all, in lager, uh, the cerevisiae is still there. So there are two yeasts acting on, um, on the fermentation process. Uh, secondly, uh, this yeast, as it reproduces and uh, produces off gases, which create alcoholic fermentation, it um, tends to uh, create clumps and fall to the bottom of the cask. So the cerevisiae uh, bacteria create clumps, but those rise to the top, they float. And so these sinking clumps, uh, they're also called flocks, and we'll get to that in a minute, but these sink sinking flocks of yeast uh, do better at cooler temperatures as they sit on the bottom of the cask. They do better in a cooler, quieter uh, environment, which is ideal for a different kind of uh, seasonal brewing. Um, as an aside, uh, you probably could guess this, but uh, Saccharomyces pastoranus, uh, named in 1870, and it's named after Louis Pasteur. Um, and I'd just like to point out here that Louis Pasteur is, is basically everywhere in the history of science and medicine. Anybody who studies history of science and medicine will not be surprised by that. I was a little surprised he managed to end up in my talk, having just taught a history of medicine class. Um, he came up a lot. He was sort of like the ghost of the class. Uh, but having just taught a history of science and medicine class, I also know that 1870 is a really weird year to name something after Louis Pasteur. So Louis Pasteur becomes like the national hero of France um, after he, uh, you know, creates a, or claims to create a rabies vaccine and it modifies uh, the smallpox uh, inoculation technique so that it's more effective and is widely used. Um, 
But that, those things happen in the 1880s. So in the 1870s, he is uh, still a humble microbiologist um, who has not successfully self-promoted himself to a lot of fame. Uh, but what he's doing as a microbiologist is he's working for uh, both beer and wine companies. In France, it's mostly wine companies. But he does manage to study the role of uh, yeasts in beer brewing. And he's the one who uh, first hypothesizes that lager must have uh, a different microorganism at work from, uh, from the traditional ales. Uh, and so when that second organism is discovered in 1870 by a chemist working at the Carlsberg Brewery actually uh, in Denmark, it's named after him as a result of that. Um, okay, so this process of flocking, I also, I hope this is not an aside within my aside, uh, but this idea of things forming clumps and falling to the bottom. In English, I associate this word flock with like flock of sheep. Um, and here you can see a flock of sheep that I think at least superficially resemble our little bands of, of, uh, of yeasts. Uh, but that flocculation, uh, th that's not the word origin of, of flocculation. Um, this is pretty much the only word in English, unless you're a chemist, um, where uh, there's a, a word origin that you would recognize. And this is flocking a Christmas tree. And in English, this is a very uh, specific word that means to apply fake snow to the branches of a Christmas tree or to apply fake, fake snow to other things. You can put flocking on your driveway or something as well. Um, so flocculation uh, comes to us in English outside of science only in this one um, sort of humorously specific term. Um, so Louis Pasteur, uh, you know, this was his sort of contribution, the behavioral ecology of these yeasts. Um, and hold on just a second. And then one thing that uh, oh, let me go back. Okay, one thing that was discovered about these yeasts, um, especially the Pastorianus yeast, uh, was that uh, it was a relatively new hybrid organism. Um, its, rel its closest known relative was a cold tolerant yeast called S. bionis uh, that was used in some forms of winemaking. But the, the familial relationship between S. pastorianus, this crucial element in lager making, and S. bionis was, was actually, it, it wasn't that close. So scientists suspected that there was another uh, closer relative, a missing link, if you will, between, um, between these yeasts. Um, and so there was sort of a hunt uh, that went into this. Uh, this is the beginning of genomic research in the 1980s. Yeasts are some of the easiest organisms to study their complete, um, their complete genomic structure. And so they were, these are, these are model organisms during that time period. Um, and the hunt took a long time, but because these yeasts are worth money, uh, they were studied in a way that most single-celled microorganisms just are not because they are invisible, they inhabit the world all around us, but uh, unless they make us sick or make money for humans, they're almost always just ignored. Um, so Pastorianus and its origins only became important in this sort of uh, late 20th sort of biogenetic uh, milieu. Um, and so there was a real hunt for the true missing link. Um, and it initially seemed to end here, uh, which produces mysteries of its own, which is why, um, I mean, the, the main moral here, which I'll get to in a second, is that uh, microbiologists are perhaps not the world's best historians. Um, microbiologists studying uh, wild yeasts found in the Patagonia highlands of Argentina, discovered in beech trees, in fact, in the funguses of beech trees, uh, a fungus of a fungus. So yeasts that were growing on the funguses in trees in the Patagonia highlands uh, had uh, a microorganism that was very, very close to uh, Pastorianus. And uh, they decided that this must be it. Um, 
But if you do the math, that would mean that this, they named this Eubionis. So Saccharomyces Eubionis, living happily in South America, somehow made its way uh, to Europe uh, in approximately 1400 AD. Uh, so this is fudging the Columbian exchange by a good century. Um, this was published in, um, you know, the, a, a well-regarded uh, journal, but their conclusion was that this must be uh, the wild genetic stock of lager brewing yeast without sort of connecting the dots as to how that possibly could have happened. Um, one of the sites of evidence that they pointed to uh, was that in the Patagonian highlands, there is a tradition of drinking a fermented beverage that's made from uh, the Saccharomyces eubionis. Um, chicha. So that's, this was one of their, uh, you know, they, they did do a tiny amount of cultural anthropology to point out that there were some uh, parallel developments in human culture related to this organism. Um, in 2018, a much more plausible uh, origin story comes up, and that's the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and this is a similar kind of environment to the Patagonian highlands. Highlands and it has a similar forestry structure, uh, different trees. But indeed, once scientists started looking for it, uh, this same organism, uh, Eubionis, uh, was found in this area as well. Uh, so these are these are identical species, um, but it's it's clear from the genetic the genomic pattern that that they have been in Tibet for just as long, if not longer, than they've been living natively in South America. And so this brings the uh, Eurasian land bridge into the picture and shows a way where uh, the sort of parent molecule for, or the parent microorganism for uh, uh, for lager has an origin uh, in Asia. Uh, and again, um, the scientists bring up a tiny, tiny amount of cultural anthropology to say that these regions also have an alcoholic drink, chang, that is uh, that is not that is barley brewed with this same uh, Saccharomyces uh, pastoriana, uh, Saccharomyces eubiana, um, and it has been being brewed for the last thousand years for sure. Uh, so this brings up how things got from. Uh, East Asia into Europe um, a long time ago. Uh, obviously, the Silk Road was established at a certain point, um, but a lot more back and forth was happening in the 13th and 14th century uh, with the Pax Mongolica and the Khanates that were set up in the wake of Genghis Khan and his uh, and his progeny, his his heirs, uh, ruling parts of Eurasia into Eastern Europe. Uh, and you can see sort of the widest reaches of the Pax Mongolica here in this slide. Um, most likely, uh, the beverage Chang was not the thing imported into Europe, uh, but instead the typical traditional practice for how this uh, this beverage is made is by sort of scooping off uh, sort of a scum layer from the top and uh, ostensibly also from the bottom of uh, the beverage, letting them dry out and then adding those to uh, a new stock, basically, which is a, a very typical fermentation pattern. So presumably, as the Khanates expanded and uh, set up sort of um, more, you know, uh, households and things like that in Eurasian settlements, uh, these kinds of foodways were beverage ways uh, moved with them. And this was, you know, this, this is getting uh, this crucial ingredient, this crucial yeast, much, much closer to Central Europe and to Bavaria, where, you know, lager is, that's considered the heartland of lager production um, than, you know, Western, the Western Andes. So um, the Pax Mongolica ends uh, with an event that historians of medicine and science uh, know a lot about, and that's uh, the bubonic plague. So this is a, a painting of the port city of Kaffa, uh, which was laid siege uh, by the Mongol leader, uh, Johnny Beg, in 1346. Uh, this was the second siege of the city. His troops had uh, retreated for a season to sort of regroup and um, uh, rearm. 
and it wasn't going very well. Um, but during the second siege, um, it became evident that his troops had uh, uh, acquired bubonic plague um, in Central Asia while they had been regrouping and they started dying at a very fast rate. Johnny Begg, uh, not one to miss an opportunity, ordered uh, that the, um, the, the catapults that the army was using uh, catapult the corpses of the dead soldiers into the walled city, uh, hoping that the uh, stench and pestilence would drive villagers out of, uh, out of the gates. Um, this is considered sort of the first use of biological warfare in the history of medicine. Um, and, and it was effective, which I'll get to in a second, um, but not knowing a lot about Khanates or uh, or the, ba the battles from this very early period, um, and thinking that the name Johnny Bag uh, had a really Hollywood ring to it, um, I just wanted to sort of check my check my sources here. And so I did a tiny bit of research into uh, this Khanate and the Golden Horde, which is the the Khanate that incorporates uh, much of present day Russia and well parts of present day Russia and Ukraine. Um, and I have to say, I don't think he invented this technique. I think catapulting uh, smelly corpses into cities was a pretty tried and true battle technique of this time. And I think the hope was that it would be the smell or perhaps uh, you know, the fear inducing inducement of these uh, very decrepit decaying bodies that would break the spirit of villagers and not necessarily some kind of understanding of, of the contagion of the plague. Um, but the siege indeed, it did break, um, but the decimated Mongol cavalry and army that surrounded the city was not able to capture or kill the Kaffa residents that they had been uh, planning to, um, to take into custody. Uh, many of them escaped into Southern and Eastern Europe. And you see wherever they land, uh, where these refugees from Kaffa went, uh, you see plague spreading beginning in 1346. Um, this is an infamous plague that spreads uh, very quickly and it kills between 30 to 60%, 30 to 60% of Europe's population um, in the late part of the 14th century. Um, so it's not a great moment for uh, Europe at this time. Um, and here I, I'm gonna have to fudge a little. I have a slide here that's not Bosch, uh, but is um, uh, is a picture of Arctic core ice. Um, and I had planned here to look at um, a, an unexpected, an unintended benefit of uh, the decimation of the European population uh, that was reported widely uh, two or three years ago is that lead production and lead mining throughout Europe um, almost completely ended. Uh, lead production and lead mining were at such high levels and creating so much uh, lead pollution and lead toxicity uh, that it was almost definitely affecting uh, behavior and uh, sort of, uh, you know, rational capacities in, um, in the populations there. And when these levels went down, uh, lead mining really never, um, when, it, when it recovered, there were more safe techniques at use, basically. Uh, not especially safe, but safe enough so that the entire population of the continent was not being affected uh, by passive pollution. They know this, scientists know this, uh, because of the Arctic ice core, because of Arctic ice cores. This is one library of Arctic ice cores. These are sort of the archive of weather and um, you know, atmospheric pollutants and things like that. Um, and it goes back uh, a very long way, well into the last uh, glacial periods. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I, I'm not going to, because it turns out uh, the idea of augers and the drills that they use for uh, digging into ice uh, have uh, a partial origin also in Asian technologies. Um, I vastly underestimated the um, complexity and the amount that's been written on uh, Asian drilling techniques, uh, especially salt drilling, which is where some of these techniques overlap. Um, and I was very hesitant to bring, you know, my breezy level of knowledge on the topic to uh, interpret at this session, um, knowing that many of my colleagues 
you know, have read Joseph Needham and others who uh, know a lot more about these topics than, than I do. So this is part of the larger project is to look into augers and uh, the technology of spiral drills versus um, hydraulic drills, uh, but I'm not there yet. So I did want to sort of present this because I think it's a really interesting connection between East and West, uh, but I'm really not ready to say more about it or to give you the sort of just so, so story about how those technologies combined or disconnected, okay? Um, so back to the story that I am telling and can tell, uh, which is that all is not completely doom and gloom in Europe. Um, there is also a uh, lager uh, sort of evolving itself during this time period after being carried uh, by uh, these uh, Mongol conquerors into Europe. Uh, this yeast is allowed to sort of um, hybridize with European yeasts that have been there, including um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which is the original ale yeast. Um, and this is when lagers really come into their own. By the 15th century in Bavaria, lagers are being brewed. Um, it is very likely that the actual origin of lagers um, is somewhere in Czechoslovakia or Hungary, a part of Eastern Europe that the, um, the sort of Pax Mongolica uh, reached more, penetrated more, more completely. Um, but so the beer has improved during this time period. Um, and let's see. And from the 16th to the 19th century, uh, lager is still a relatively seasonal product. Um, it could be stored longer than ales and it fermented at lower temperatures. So it was usually by default sort of a fall and winter beer. Um, and one thing I realized just in the course of writing this talk is that the seasonality of beers uh, in pre-industrial times is completely different from the seasonality of beers uh, in current times. I suspect that I am not the first person to uh, make this observation. I, I imagine somewhere out there, there's a book called, you know, The Shifting Seasons of Beers. Um, that seems like a very likely thing for people to be interested in. Uh, but it is a, a worthy point in this talk that um, the, the seasonality, when you're supposed to drink a certain beer or when it's appropriate, has totally changed. Um, and that, of course, now with uh, refrigeration and sort of the industrial production of beer, uh, beer does not have that kind of seasonality. It's expected to be available year round uh, and seasonal varieties that are produced uh, have a lot more to do with sort of um, our associations with celebrations. It's sort of like the pumpkin spice latte effect, but on beers. Um, so some beers correspond to tr the traditional seasons in which they could be created um, when natural weather patterns were guiding beer production, but many do not basically. And I, I, that's a, an, a, a point worth uh, for, uh, mentioning because my next point is that uh, part of that change happens with uh, cold storage techniques. And I'm being very careful with my language here. I don't mean um, electric refrigeration uh, or the development of um, sort of industrial production of ice. Uh, cold storage techniques using naturally produced ice happen much, much earlier. Um, they begin at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, mainly in the United States at the start. And they, um, and they spread rapidly um, throughout the United States, uh, but into Europe as well, um, specifically into Germany, actually. Um, embracing iced or chilled drinks uh, became fashionable first among wealthy Americans in the early 19th century. Um, and by the late 19th century, this was a, ice was an affordable luxury for many people. Um, and actually, I, I think this is one of the few things that makes me a makes me feel most American. Today is Thanksgiving, an American holiday, and reflecting on what it means to be American, besides having a sort of very unfortunate accent in English, um, I really love iced drinks. So at a restaurant, you know, not just at a restaurant, but even at home, I'll pour myself a really large glass of ice water 
um, and just tastes great. I'm not worried about ruining my digestive tract or anything like that. It's just, you know, if you're an American, you associate that with pure refreshment. Um, so that's obviously weird and particular to my nationality. Um, and it did not catch on on many places, um, although it did catch on with colonials in Hong Kong um, to a certain extent. There's evidence in 1864 of Hong Kong colonials uh, drinking iced uh, ginger beer and iced porter. Um, and there is increasing evidence that ice was imported by ship into Hong Kong in larger and larger quantities from the 1860s uh, well into the 20th century. Um, so Germans were the European culture that were partially persuaded in the value of chilled drinks. And this was in part because lagers were often, oh, shoot, ah, I'll come back to that. Uh, lagers were often drunk, uh, chilled, uh, not necessarily ice cold, uh, but cool. And there was a period in the 19th century where it was in fashion in Germany to uh, drink a lager with ice in it, actually. Um, so lagers became one of the few iced beverages that Germans sort of uh, popularized. Um, but lagers at this time, uh, became really popular really quickly. So this is just a quick engram. It's like sort of the, the historian's uh, cheater way of, of proving or establishing a trend. Um, you can see just the word usage, uh, in the word frequency usage of the word lager, and you can see it just absolutely skyrockets between 1850 and 1860, and then it stays up uh, until the turn of the 20th century. So this was the beer of the moment for um, 40 to 50 years, um, not just in Europe, but uh, in many, many parts of the world. Um, and Germans, in response to this popularity, uh, changed the structure of their brewery slightly. So um, this is a modern day brewery. This, is, this was just a very handy blueprint that shows you uh, the, the way that uh, grain and water moves through a brewery, which is it starts um, at the ground level, but then an elevator immediately brings it up to a high level. Um, and sort of the, the entire process of beer making is one that uses gravity to help, you know, these very heavy substances that are contained in um, very heavy duty, uh, now stainless steel, previously sometimes copper casks, sort of fall from one level to another. And so breweries uh, in this 19th century period, they scale up. Uh, they make more beer, and they also add in an extra uh, room, uh, which is a storehouse or a warehouse level. Um, I believe 10 shown in this picture is not actually a warehouse at all. I think those are conditioning casks that are meant for short-term conditioning. Uh, again, I said this is a, a modern blueprint, but that is essentially where in the production cycle and the sort of production geography of a of a brewery, you would see these kinds of warehouses being set up basically. Um, so breweries scale up, uh, they add warehouse space, um, they become more popular and they also export themselves. Um, so the export of German brewing expertise arrives in East Asia, uh, not long after the surge in popularity of lagers in Europe. Uh, beer was uh, welcomed by colonials as a taste of home and uh, and also as a refreshing and sort of reassuring proof of modernity, hygiene, cleanliness, and orderly industrial production. Um, and uh, most breweries also produced soft drinks or bottled water. Um, and even in places where there was not much of a beer drinking culture, um, this is definitely true. Um, in parts of, of China, and I'll talk about the San Miguel Brewery in, in the Philippines in a minute, um, that, that idea that there's a bottling uh, facility that's producing uh, hygienic drinks is an important part of why these places remain popular and how they get built. Um, so there's really uh, a huge surge in the number of breweries and importing a German brewer into your brewery was sort of uh, the peak of, uh, you know, excellence during this time. Uh, the very first brewery, I believe, was actually opened in 1876 uh, by a Japanese uh, train, a, yes, a German trained Japanese man in for Sapporo beer in Hokkaido. Um, 
I'll mostly be talking about European colonization in this section, uh, but it's not much of a stretch in the very early, in the late 19th century to think of the island of Hokkaido as a colonized territory. The colonization is taking place by Japan rather than by Western Europe, uh, but similar processes are at work there. Um, so San Miguel in the Philippines opens a brewery in 1890. This is before um, the civil war there against Spain. And also I'll be talking about the civil war with the United States that's fought immediately after the Spanish uh, civil war. Um, this was the first brewery in Southeastern Asia um, and it echoed the successes of European style brewers, breweries. So the architecture of the building, um, the production line, uh, the managers were all sort of coming from Europe. Uh, and there were plans for a Hong Kong brewery, um, which was expected to be the largest brewery in the region. Uh, but this plan was announced in February of 1894. Um, I'm not sure which month bubonic plague breaks out in Hong Kong, uh, but 1894, sort of like 2020, uh, just kind of got away from a lot of people. And so while the uh, managers or the, the um, financiers of this brewery uh, had already secured land in uh, either North Point or Wanzai. Um, they had secured land and they at least claimed that they had secured an adequate water supply uh, given Hong Kong's struggles with water that seems dubious, but they claimed that there was enough water from a naturally occurring stream there to, su to support a, a brewery, a large brewery. Um, but by in 1895, the land is resold again. It was never developed as any kind of, of a brewery, presumably because um, either these owners fled or uh, something else happened. Um, Characteristics of these Asian breweries, uh, they all brewed out lagers, uh, which now had become associated uh, with bottled beer and associated with uh, being served cold, uh, specifically chilled by ice, uh, not just cask, uh, cask temperature or uh, storage room or warehouse room temperature. Um, and they capitalized on the abundant fresh water and sort of uh, naturally clean and hygienic spaces um, that some of these places had to offer. This was um, often that was part of, of the claim. And uh, that Shen Hao uh, at Redmond University has a, a great recent article, Nature's Tonic, on that project. Um, they required significant investment capital and expensive facilities. Um, it, this is really the period where beer becomes a, a true industry. Um, and they're enabled by glo the global movement of experts and uh, really heavy duty equipment, mainly produced in Europe at this time, um, and increasingly sophisticated understandings of the science and chemistry of brewing and quality control measures. Um, and obviously an expanding audience of willing beer consumers. Uh, which brings me to another invention uh, from this same time. It's not as much of a leap as it looks, I promise. Um, the first generation of concentration camps uh, occurs in just this same time period. So this is a Cuban uh, concentration camp. I believe this photograph is from 1898, but they were opened as early as 1896. Um, these are camps, they were originally called re-concentration camps. Um, they were conceived by Spanish, American, and Dutch colonizers at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, these are in response to uh, guerrilla warfare and uh, peasant uprisings that were directly uh, going against uh, the colonial government. Uh, these were sort of small scale fights for uh, independence and uh, anti-colonial uh, uh, sentiments. Um, and the idea here was essentially to wage war on the civilians by uprooting them and rehousing them in fairly brutal, uh, fairly brutal lodgings. So the housing in this uh, in these Cuban camps was typically abandoned um, and in very poor shape, almost uninhabitable. Uh, they were fenced off and completely closed off. And by 1898, one third of Cuba's population had been forcibly sent into these camps. Uh, many Cubans died um, in these camps. Uh, many of them uh, perished because of communicable diseases uh, that were easily spread. And many of them also died from starvation. Um, the United States, which uh, wanted Cuba independent during this period, uh, originally condemned 
Spain's reconcentration policies as cruel and inhumane. But as the United States learned when it inherited um, the Philippines, uh, it, it found these same measures uh, necessary in helping to uh, contain, again, uh, underground and guerrilla warfare uh, against uh, U U.S. colonial uh, activities. Um, already in this time period, Americans love euphemism, so these are not called reconcentration camps, they are called zones of protection. Um, and unlike the Cuban model, uh, no housing at all was, was provided. Um, it, and it's interesting to note here that it seems like U.S. policies uh, are really rooted in historic treatments uh, that white Americans had of indigenous Americans and black Americans. Um, and that neither, uh, neither policies, you know, no uh, Jim Crow laws nor, uh, nor uh, American Indian reservations made any accommodations for, for housing until well into the 20th century. So the, the policies of creating these camps are, are different. Um, and once again, it's it's really the same story. There's a cholera epidemic that kills many of the uh, inmates in these camps um, and disease, uh, malnutrition and fatalities are, are quite high. Um, and this is true for the third uh, case study here as, as well. Um, the Boer War had concentration camps that started out as refugee camps with the idea that uh, these would be human, you know, humanitarian interventions for displaced families. Um, but the, the, that, that humanitarian sentiment did not last for very long. Um, and it quickly warped into warehousing for Boer civilians, specifically women and children who were affiliated with known uh, soldiers fighting against the British in the Boer War. Um, and once again, these, these are very high, uh, very large scale. So uh, just as in the Cuban case, hundreds of thousands of, of people are housed in these tent cities. Um, and it, so that's a little different from the Philippines where it, it was somewhere between 20 to 40,000 uh, inmates that the United States placed in these concentration camps. Um, and just as the Spanish based uh, their colonization on the, the mission system in, in the Cuban case and administering it, and the Americans focused on uh, their policies toward Indians and uh, Blacks, I expect that the uh, British experience of managing Ireland and the Irish specifically during the Great Irish Famine um, in the mid 19th century, uh, deeply influence the, the way that they created these first sort of containment camps, um, which again are also uh, sort of a very early iteration of refugee camps. That was their initial intent. Um, so the people who created these two product categories came from the same societies, um, concentration camps, the Lager and the Lager. Um, they come from the same societies, they share the same visions of expansive, orderly, and Eurocentric traditions, um, and they were empowered by the same technologies of hygiene, inventory, monitored scientific domestication. They are not identical places or institutions, that's definitely not my argument. Uh, you know, the technology of barbed wire is essential in maintaining order in refugee camps. Uh, the technology of um, creating these enormous copper kettles uh, for example, which sort of scales up in the early part of the 19th century is essential for the expansion of uh, European style breweries. So I'm not saying they're the same, but I'm also saying that they're not as far apart as they might initially seem. And this idea of warehousing um, and the idea of domestication have a lot to do with modernization and links between uh, Europe and Asia and really the world as a whole. Many of the stories here coming from South Africa, Cuba, are global stories, not just related to one or two places. Um, so above all, breweries and camps are both sites of domestication, the gradual bringing to order of a poorly understood, of poorly understood and illegible masses. Um, in the case of these early internment camps, the subject of domesticity or domestication is not yeast, but the souls, specifically the mass populations that passively and actively resisted colonial state authority. Um, and my last point here is that towards systems of much more, sorry, wait, 
I lost my place. Um, these camps were an initial first step towards systems of much more complete uh, domestic, domestication of civilian populations. Uh, while the scientific racism that provided sort of the fig leaf for the inhumane treatment that uh, Cuban and uh, Filipino and some South African inmates um, experienced. Um, that scientific racism flourished in the early part of the 20th century. Now it is diminished in some levels, uh, but the will to domesticate uh, by creating, expanding, and neglecting institutions like camps, like the Lager, and manufacturing, advertising, and creating increasingly niche, increasingly creative versions of slightly toxic, addictive surplus carbohydrates. Um, this will has only grown stronger in the past century, and it really shows no signs of, of slowing down. Um, okay, thank you. That's the end of my talk. I welcome any questions or comments, suggestions for improvement you may have. All right, thank you so much, um, Professor Smith, for that very um, interesting um, lecture. And certainly bringing these two things together um, is sort of um, unexpected, but very interesting. Um, we already are starting to have, we've, we've already had, had a few questions. So I think um, I would not want to waste any time and we can move uh, to the questions uh, immediately. Um, so the first question uh, we have, I think, is about the uh, sort of the earlier bit of uh, of your lecture. And it talks about whether the fact that, you know, beer, um, so the question basically is, did the popularity of beer threaten the food production due to increased wheat demand? Uh, okay. Uh, the short answer is, um, in most places, uh, no. Uh, we don't have great uh, insight into that for ancient societies. Uh, certainly famine and uh, acute malnutrition are, are pretty common in agricultural societies. Um, and actually the, so the, but there's, there's very few uh, cases where uh, production of alcoholic beverages is so high that it uh, really threatens uh, the the food supply. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that with um, vodka production in Russia that I know about, um, and the state mandates uh, you know a cessation of alcohol production during that time period. Um, so I, I could say more about that, but the the short answer is not usually. So. All right. Thank you. Um, and just uh, just as a reminder, please, if anyone has any questions, please um, submit them through the Q&A button in Zoom, and then we can uh, read them, and Professor Smith can then answer them. Next question is, rather, is a rather long question. Um, so Scarlett asks, uh, the domestication of yeasts and domestic animals, such as cows, sounds epic in the pre-industrialized years. However, after modernization, or rather industrialization, Situation between wheat yeasts and cows changed. Uh, we are fine with yeast in the beer factory, but consider cows in milk, fa milk factories cruel and evil. So our question is, what do you think is the reason behind people's different reactions to industrialized yeasts and industrialized milk cows? Uh, okay, well, I mean, I think, uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's an interesting one and it, it sort of verges into ethics. So I, I think you could answer this question in several different ways. Um, I think that uh, sort of the development of um, empathy in humans uh, develops in different places, in different cultures at different levels. So there are some cultures where uh, there's a very strong connection to, uh, to many different kinds of animals, not just pets, but also working animals like cows and chickens, um, that borders on sentimentality. So people who you know, are ethical vegetarians because they think it's cruel to eat meat. That's a fairly common reaction in modern Western society. Uh, but throughout history, that's a fairly uncommon reaction. Not, not unheard of, but fairly uncommon. Um, that empathy, you know, is different for different people. Uh, some people are very concerned about the welfare of uh, rabbits, for example. Um, 
and you know that's their 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 passion is for you know a very small animal that most people don't it's not really on their radar as, as an animal being chronically abused um some people are very concerned about sharks right shark fin soup and the, the sort of um cruelty of of killing sharks in that way whereas i i don't think that before you know, I don't think until recently humans have been asked to extend empathy towards, you know, wild animals that are typically perceived to be dangerous. Um, do humans have a capacity for empathy with single celled organisms they can't see? Um, I, you know, I, I know, I, I don't think so. Um, but that's my own opinion. I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly possible. Certainly these yeast organisms show, uh, you know, a will to improve and survive and uh, adapt, uh, just like all life forms that is impressive and poorly understood, uh, but useful to humans and, you know, creates, makes a better world for us in some ways. So, uh, you know, maybe in a thousand, 10,000 years, there will be sort of, uh, you know, uh, the yeast protection society and, and just, but, but I, I, you know, now, no. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, a question I wanted to ask is actually because I remember that that um, uh, was also sort of in the summary of your talk, whether you could talk a bit more about the etymology of um, lager in terms of, uh, well, a sort of beer and lager in terms of uh, um, well, a concentration camp. Um, because I, I was quite Despite growing up in Germany, I actually only learned the word lager for a beer um, when I was moving to the UK. But I, I, so that, because I think it's a very specific kind of beer. But of course, lager for a concentration camp is very common. Uh, so I wonder, I was quite surprised by connecting that. So I wonder whether you could talk a bit more about that. Uh, sure. So, I mean, lager... Uh... In Russian, which is I do I do not speak German, would, would be helpful here to to be able to tap into that knowledge base. Uh, but in in Russian, you can use the word lager just to mean camp. You can send the kids off to a lager for for summer, for example. Uh, you can go to a family lager like for relaxation and nature appreciation. Uh, but it is often used to refer to labor camps, um, and and as uh, and that's that's a word I I. I saw a lot in the archives as the, the shorthand. Actually, officials rarely used gulag, uh, which is like the sort of official Soviet abbreviation for the, the prison camps that they ran. Um, and they rarely spelled out the whole word. Um, so lager for them was like sort of a, a euphemism kind of like, you know. Um, for the for the beer, it's just a shortening of, uh, you would just say lager beer. And I assume that is is just to, you know, originally it was to distinguish it from ales, which are not warehoused. Um, so there was regular beer and then there was beer that had been stored, which implied, um, that, and this process is actually called lagering. I mean, not, I mean it, it's, the, the verb is, is also, you know, warehousing. I mean, I guess it works in English. Um, and so in the way that language evolves, that the beer part just got cut off and lager is now sort of the, the preferred terminology for that. Um, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a crazy coincidence or anything. It just happens that I'm a bit ignorant in Russian and I thought these two words were exactly the same. And I have for decades just sort of wondered why they were exactly the same. It turns out they're not exactly the same. They're close homonyms, but not precise. And um, they also come from a, a very similar root word that is the root word for a lot of words. Lager, it like lay down, like to lay something down. Uh, ledger, to you know, to write down things. These are all words that that come from the same root word. So it's it's not you know there's there's no like brilliant insight there. Um, it was just a starting point basically. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question is about objectification. So. Uh, the question is concentration camp also reminds me of the process of concentration and production process in factories like treating humans as things so uh, the question is whether you think objectification plays a role in this process um that's a great point uh i i am interested so the the, the term concentration camp um it, you know, the, the original term, uh, 
it was a reconcentration camp, uh, which is obviously not a word you use in English. Um, I'm not a great Spanish speaker, so I, I don't understand the, the sort of implication of reconcentration, reconcentracia. Um, it, does, it doesn't mean much more than just concentration would. So I'd be interested to look into why that phrase uh, was chosen. Um, I mean, I do think that the, the idea of the original camps was always sort of like a resettling. Um, and that might be an idea that, uh, that like this, this, um, this idea that people are in the wrong spots uh, and they need to, to be moved again. They've, they've ended up somewhere that's like sort of a, a poisonous environment or a hostile political situation and they need to be physically removed from that, uh, you know, those bad ideas or that bad ideology to sort of um, become more pure and to get rid of those bad influences, basically. They're, they're the idea that you actually need to physically pick people up and move them away in order to, you know, remove the threat of guerrilla warfare from the state's point of view. But the state speaking would say that this is to, you know, protect and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, make sure that these these students are not um, are not vulnerable or these uh, these people are not vulnerable to these kinds of bad influences. Great, thank you. Um, I should add this. So, uh, Dr. Jonathan Troy was a postdoc here at uh, um, at the institute. Says uh, just to add to that etymological question, uh, lager derives from Proto-Germanic legra, meaning a place to lie or to store. So historically, it has also referred to army, cam army camps in both German and Cockney languages. Um, yeah, and we get legal in German and modern English there. Yeah, that sort of ties in with what you. Yes. Oh, Lair, yeah, Lair was the one that I was I was trying to think of that example too because it's um, uh, it's just it's just a really old word. It shows up in a lot of um, you know hunting terminology and uh, but just you know it's 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 got a, it's gone in a lot of different directions uh, because obviously it's you know it's a basic human activity and so um, you know setting something down but you you do that in different ways you do that both uh, metaphorically and and physically and in in these cases um, you know that that's. I think that's true for, for, for both of these cases, that there's a, a physical sense of laying down, you know, log at the camp, you can be somewhere you sleep, but you're also sort of, you know, stuck there if the, if the connotation is the prison. So thank you for that, Jonathan. Mm. I guess another question would really be whether this kind of, um, between domestication of food and people, whether there are any other, I mean, this is sort of one case that you've presented, but whether there's any other examples that you've been able to identify. Um, I know this is probably a, a sort of a, a new project, but in any case, whether there are any other such parallel developments that you uh, have um, seen or been able to identify. I mean, uh, yes, I, I don't have specific examples, but I think that that food and food production and its recent industrialization um, and upscaling are, are such are so embedded in all human projects that really you could take any food project, any food product um, and any unrelated but uh, sort of looming, uh, you know, force, you know, bread and authoritarianism, uh, you know, meat and, uh, you know, global warming. I, I mean, that one's actually quite obvious, right? Um, but I, I don't think it's, you know, I don't, I don't actually think you need very many steps to, to complete the doublet. I mean, I think you can get from one place to another quite quickly, actually, um, because agriculture has and, and food production has such an embedded and uh, important and intimate role it, at all levels of, I mean, of human society. It's, it's um, an enormous source of income. It's an enormous source of sort of uh, cultural awareness and comfort. You know, it, it has a lot of meanings in a lot of different ways. So because you can go in so many directions, it's, it's a really flexible tool for thinking about, you know, larger uh, human challenges. Great. Are there any other questions um, from either the, from the audience? Um, then please submit them. Any other questions? Um, if not, then 
um, please all join me in uh, thanking Professor Smith again for uh, that very interesting uh, talk. Um, and uh, I think the recording of the lecture will be made available so that uh, more people will have uh, access to it. So we will make that available um, on the website. Um, and of course, um, we will be in touch with everyone uh, about uh, next um, lecture in um, the lecture series. Um, and so thanks once more to all the attendees for coming and uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Smith, for taking the time to talk to us about your research and uh, introducing it to us and giving us such an interesting lecture. Okay, well, thank you very much for having yeah, me. So thank you so much. You. Okay. Great. Many thanks to Jenny. Great oh. talk. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> yes. Okay. You, 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 it, it reminds me on fermentation on soybeans that we are working on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was um, I was worried that you had a beer person and that, I mean, this is a really sort of, you know, um, I'm not a beer history expert by mm -hmm. any means, uh, but I was I was a little worried that that somebody would be very bored by by my talk coming no, to no, expect no. something new. And no. so but I checked you. It doesn't seem like you have a beer person. So that's OK. Uh -huh. um, but but I think what you what if I understand you correctly, what, what you want to say is, you know, this fermentation, this, this, this um, yeast came from Asia to Europe, but the, um, the metaphorical use of the term is actually pretty European, right? Yes. I mean, I, um, I, I have to say that I, I think it's, um, you know, there's sort of a round trip to this, right? So it goes from mm -hmm. these Tibetan top plateaus, evolves in Eastern Europe gets picked up in Western Europe and then is commodified in this, this really odd way, you know, it's like sort of, uh, you know, it becomes one of the first, uh, you know, fads, right, of the 19th mm. century, and then kind of travels back to, to Asia as, as in bottles in this very industrial form. Um, the words themselves are, um, I mean, I think that um, you know, I, I think in English, there's not a great term for, I, I, I mean, Lager might not be any better, really, but camp mm -hmm. is a really weak term for um, refugee camps and mm -hmm. concentration camps. I've, I've always felt like it's, it's not mm -hmm. especially useful description uh, mm -hmm. for the same reasons that Lager in Russian is also, is also weak. But uh, from my experience, when I hear the word Lager, I usually think of these um, penal colonies, basically, these, these, mm -hmm. these places of punishment and confinement uh, mm -hmm. in a way that I don't if I just hear the word camp. Um, mm. possibly other people who have different associations would, would feel differently about that. Um, mm. But I, I do, in my own writing, I'm always looking for a more precise way of talking about uh, refugee camps as, as institutions. And mm. it's a very unsatisfactory mm. process in English, I guess. I, I, there's not mm. just one, there's not one good term that, uh, that sums up um, sort of their relation to other kinds of camps and, uh, and how they're also a bit different. So um, it, it's a little thing, you know, but that was, that's just sort of where I started with this project. Mm. Um, and I do think, I do think it's interesting that the words are um, at least a, a bit related and that they have this mm. sort of explosion in the late 19th century uh, that, you know, I think, I think there's, there's a little something there. It might not be the biggest mm -hmm. insight in the world, but it's right. something. Right. Right. No. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting term. It's an interesting term, but it's it's hardly translatable. Is it? I I agree. I mean, I um. This is an ongoing challenge for me. Is okay. to um. You know, I I see uh part of my work now. I mean, part of my work is still just very interested in. Mm. Uh, food and the environmental mm. impact of food industrialization, but mm. I, I'm also looking more at human institutions um, mm. and uh, refugee camps in specific, yeah. and um, I, I find them hard to, uh, I find it hard to describe well how I see them as both mm. similar to and different from uh, concentration camps or mm penal colonies or mm -hmm. uh, penal, penal labor colonies. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's lots of different uh, institutions that are uh, somewhat similar, but not, not identical, uh, that they seem to all have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, euphemistic names that don't really right. do a great job explaining what they, what they are or how they warehouse mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it's something I'm still thinking about. It's it's a pretty new project. So I don't I don't have uh, the authoritative insight on this that I might in a few years if I yeah, if I keep great. at it. Well, <laughs> I'm sure that in, in 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 very shortly we 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 can you know have your further thoughts on this very interesting question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jenny.